Normally when I preach a psalm, I have a handful that I can pick from. There's no secret, there's, there's no complicated formula by the way we decide which psalm is going to be preached which Sunday. Lee just says, these are the ones that haven't been preached yet. And then we pick one. Well, this Sunday, clearly I had one left to pick, and it's Psalm 83. This will be the 150th of 150 psalms preached from this pulpit. Let's stand together as we hear the word of the Lord. <coughs> a song, a psalm of Asaph. O oh God, do not keep silence. Do not hold your peace or be still, O oh God. For behold, your enemies make an uproar. Those who hate you have raised their heads. They lay crafty plans against your people. They consult together against your treasured ones. They say, come, let us wipe them out as a nation. Let the name of Israel be remembered no more. For they conspire with one accord against you. They make a covenant. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gabal and Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, Ashur also has joined them. They are the strong arm of the children of Lot. Do to them as you did to Midian, as to Sisera and Jabin at the river Kishon, who were destroyed at Endor, who became dung for the ground. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, all their princes like Ziba and Zalmunna, who said, Let us take possession for ourselves of the pastures of God. O oh my God, make them like whirling dust, like chaff before the wind, as fire consumes the forest, as the flame sets the mountains ablaze, so may you pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your hurricane. Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek your name, O Lord. Let them be put to shame and dismayed forever. Let them perish in disgrace, that they may know that you alone, whose name is the Lord, are the Most High over all the earth. Let us pray. Our gracious Father, we come to you through Jesus Christ, your Son, and in the Holy Spirit, to praise you and thank you for the gift of your word and to ask that it may be made effective this morning in our hearts through the power of the Spirit given to us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Psalm 83 probably does not warm your heart the way that, say, Psalm 23 would, with its beautiful image of the Lord as our shepherd. And it may not arouse your emotions the way that Psalm 2 or 45 or 72 might, with their beautiful depictions of the Messianic kingdom. Nor does it resonate with you the way that, say, a penitential psalm, such as Psalm 32 or Psalm 51, which declare God's grace to the repentant, uh, might do. This is an imprecatory psalm, meaning it's a psalm that calls down God's judgment on His enemies. Now you wonder why it was the last one chosen. Are we really supposed to delight in judgment? Are we really supposed to let this resonate with our hearts this morning? Or aren't we supposed to treat judgment more like we might treat cough syrup? We know we got to take it down, but it's not something we're going to enjoy. We're not going to make any, any uh, pretensions that we like it. That it's a, 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 yes, it's necessary, the Bible teaches it, but surely we can't be expected to enjoy a psalm like this one. I've been reading Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs, the co-founder and former CEO of Apple. Very fascinating story. When Steve Jobs was a child, his parents were not overly devoted in religious practices, but they did take Steve to a Lutheran church uh, most Sundays until 1968. In July of that year, when Steve was 13 years old, he discovered on the cover of a Life magazine 
a picture of two starving children in the Nigerian state of Biafra. And when he saw that, this 13-year-old boy took that magazine to the pastor of this Lutheran church. And he asked the pastor, does God know which finger I'm about to lift up even before I do it? The pastor said, yes, God knows everything. And then Steve pulled out that magazine and showed him the picture. And he said, does God know about these children and what's going to happen to them? The pastor said, Steve, I know you don't understand this. But yes, God knows everything he knows about these children. And from that day on, Steve Jobs wanted nothing more to do with this God. And from all I know, he never went to church again, and he practiced a form of Buddhism for the rest of his life. Now what Steve Jobs articulated as a 13-year-old boy, though he didn't realize it, and what most of us, I think, have confronted at some point in our lives is what is known as the problem of evil. If God is all-powerful, and if God is supremely good, how can there be evil? And moreover, how can God allow it to go on the way that it does for so long? Now, I can't get into all the philosophical ins and outs of that problem. I don't know that the Bible reveals a total answer to that, but it does give us comfort. And it does give us the assurance that in the face of the problem of evil, we can be absolutely certain that God is supremely good. We need not doubt His goodness in the least, but in order for us to affirm that, we must affirm that judgment is coming. Every human heart desires, cries out, for the idea that at the bottom of everything, there is ultimately a distinction between good and evil. That the power who stands behind this universe is one who is on the side of good supremely and is utterly and completely opposed to evil in every way. And don't you see, if that's true, if there is going to be an ultimate distinction between good and evil, it requires a day of reckoning to come. When every sin ever committed receives a fitting answer from God. The final judgment is ultimately the cry of every human heart that longs for justice. The Dutch Reformed theologian Hermann Bavink put it this way, all of history cries out for world judgment. And so if we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning who desire to proclaim that God is good and believe that He is good, then we must not only affirm that judgment is coming, but delight in the fact that it is coming. For what are the implications if it doesn't? If judgment does not come, then God Himself is complicit in the evil that He allows to go unanswered. If judgment does not come, then God Himself is not worthy of our worship, for He Himself becomes evil. Now this psalm is a psalm that expresses a hope for judgment to come. And it's a judgment of the nations that oppose Israel. Now, this may have been written in a specific historical circumstance when these ten nations listed in verses uh, 6 through 8 were in a league that was dedicated to the annihilation of Israel. We don't have any specific historical record of that happening. Uh, it's very possible that the psalmist is responding to a real concrete situation, but I think it's equally possible that he's writing more poetically, more imaginatively, and he's using these nations as examples of the fact that Israel is always opposed by enemies, and he's calling upon God to bring judgment. And the judgment that he cries out for in the defense of Israel is a type or a foreshadowing of the final judgment that is to come when Christ returns. And when he returns in power to judge the living and the dead, God's kingdom will come. And is that not what Jesus told us to pray for? 
to long for, to desire, and to call out to Him. Now, what does that mean to pray, Your kingdom come? Well, in a real sense, the kingdom has already come. Jesus Christ has died. He's been raised. He said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. He's been exalted to the right hand of God. He is now reigning. The reign of the risen Christ is a reality. The kingdom has come. And yet it's a secret reality. The vast majority of the human race refuses to recognize King Jesus in His sovereignty. And so to pray, Your kingdom come, is to pray for the open manifestation of the reality that is already true, that Jesus is King. It is to pray that every person and every angelic power would bow to Him. Now, if that day is going to come, it means judgment is going to come. The open manifestation of the kingship of Christ necessarily entails the judgment of His enemies. So if we pray your kingdom come, as we are commanded to do, we are praying for the judgment of God to come upon this rebellious world. This psalm divides into more or less three sections. We're not going to follow those sections exactly, but just to give you an overview of the psalm itself. It is a national lament, that, uh, a cry of, of the psalmist on behalf of the nation for God to deliver them in a time of distress. It begins with an address to God in verse 1, follows through in verses 2 to 8 with the lament itself, the, the description of the threat against the nation. And then verses 9 to 18 are the petition for God to act. And in this psalm, we're going to see then three reasons that we should desire and pray for the final judgment to come. So if you are taking notes and you just want to write one time, we should desire and pray for the final judgment, uh, then that will give you the, the beginning of the outline for all three points this morning. So the first reason then we should pray for this, we should desire and pray for the final judgment because we face a formidable enemy. We should desire and pray for the final judgment because we face a formidable enemy in verses 1 to 8. When Satan tempted the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 4, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory in one moment. And he said to Jesus, All of this I will give you, for it has been given to me and I deliver it to whom I will, if you will bow down and worship me. Have you ever thought about the audacity of that claim? Satan tells Jesus, I will give you power over the world if you will worship me. <laughs> Satan is a liar, but he was not lying on this occasion. In order for the temptation to have any effect, he'd have to be offering something he really could offer. And he is offering dominion over the world that he himself has. Satan is called in the New Testament the prince of the power of the air. He is called the God of this world. In Revelation, he's pictured as the dragon who stands behind the powers of this age, the beast from the sea who represents worldly anti-Christian powers of, of government, institution, and leaders who oppose God. The beast from the earth, the worldly anti-Christian ideology that props up and supports the other beast. But Satan is the power behind them all. He is the serpent who has seized dominion when Adam, the image of God, abdicated the throne God had given him. And his influence extends to every nation, to every human culture, to every human being born into this world. Ephesians 2, Paul declares that we are born into this world following the prince of the power of the air. We are his slaves by nature. This is not a cartoonish pitchfork and horns figure that we're dealing with. This is a spiritual power beyond our ability to confront. 
And in Revelation 12, it declares that he has one purpose. He was formerly the accuser of God's people in heaven, but Christ, having fulfilled his redemptive work, exalted now to heaven, as Revelation 12 declares, Satan has been thrown down where he has no more power to accuse us. Our high priest intercedes for us. So what is Satan's one desire? having been stripped of his ability to accuse, it is to destroy. So he pursues us. The dragon pursues the woman in Revelation 12, seeking to devour her. He will use any tool at his disposal to destroy our faith and to bring us ultimately under the judgment of God. Well, in this psalm, we see a formidable enemy against Israel, a league of ten nations. Uh, they're mentioned in verses 6 through 8. In verse 6, you have Edom mentioned, which was a relative of the Israelites, the descendants of Esau, the brother of Jacob. You have the Ishmaelites mentioned, a nomadic people who were descended from Ishmael, the son of Abraham, with his concubine Hagar. You have Moab mentioned, who was one of the lines of descent from Abraham's nephew, Lot. Then you have mentioned the Hagrites, which would have been a people who lived to the east of the Jordan and uh, fought at times with the Transjordanian tribes. Also mentioned are Gabal. Gabal probably a reference to a mountain region in Edom to the southeast of Israel. Ammon, another line of descent from Lot and Amalek, uh, the first nation with whom Israel came into warfare after they had come out of Egypt. Israel's oldest enemy, with the exception of Egypt herself, you might say, all of the nations I've just mentioned in verses 6 through 7a were located to the southeast or to the east of Israel. But then in verse 7b, you have mentioned Philistia, which is to the southwest of Israel, and the inhabitants of Tyre, which is to the northwest of Israel. So you've got two lines of enemies on either side encircling, and the capstone of them all which would have invaded from the north. Completing the circle is verse 8, Ashur, which is a reference to Assyria. Now, Assyria located much more distantly, but it was customary for them to come down from the north for an invasion, forming almost a complete circle around the people. And the, the, the most uh, formidable of these enemies, of course, is the last, Assyria. Assyria is the power behind the others. They're called here the strong arm of the children of Lot, meaning they're the ones who really wield the power. They're the ones who are directing this assault. But not only is this foe all around Israel, notice what else is mentioned about them. They are confidently arrogant of victory in verse 2. Behold, your enemies make an uproar. Those who hate you have raised their heads. Not only are they confident, they are united. Verse uh, 3 mentions that they lay crafty plans. They consult together. Verse 5 mentions that they conspire with one accord. They covenant together with one another to defeat Israel. And what is their purpose? Is it that they might bring Israel into submission as a client state? Is it that they might force Israel to pay tribute? No. Their purpose goes well beyond that. Their purpose could have come right out of Nazi propaganda. Look at verse 4. Come, let us wipe them out as a nation. Let the name of Israel be remembered no more. Their goal is nothing less than the total annihilation of God's elect people. So, in short, Israel's foes are confident, numerous, united, powerful merciless and ubiquitous. That means all around, if you didn't know that. The chances of survival are slim to none if God does not intervene. And that is why Asaph calls out to God as he does in verse 1, as he does throughout the rest of the psalm. He prays for God to deliver His people. Now notice how he crafts this prayer. There's, there's subtle moves he makes uh, that indicate the love of God for His people. 
Notice in verse 3, for example, he says, They lay crafty plans against your people. They consult together against your treasured ones. But then if you look to verse 2, it mentions your enemies and those who hate you, as in God. And then verse 5, uh, against you, God, they make a covenant. So in verse 2, they are aligned against Israel. In verse, I'm sorry, verse 3, verses 2 and 5, they are aligned against God Himself. Now, what is the meaning of this subtle shift in terminology? It is that God takes an attack on His people very, very personally. You attack a man's wife, you are attacking that man. And God is so bound in covenant love to Israel that to assault Israel is to, as though it were to assault a man's wife. A lesson that Saul of Tarsus learned when he was on the road to Damascus to lock up more Christians and the risen Christ appeared to him and said in Acts chapter 9, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting not my people? Why are you persecuting me? To persecute Christians is to persecute Christ. That is how closely Christ identifies with His people. So we face an enemy who is formidable. A power that stands behind all the institutions of this world that oppose God. And we may recognize the warfare, especially when we hear about things like church bombings in the Middle East, for example. But does the war touch us here at home as well, where we live relatively comfortable lives and don't suffer as much for our faith? Does the war matter to us? Should we really think in terms of having enemies who are formidable? Absolutely we should. The war takes different forms, but in our culture, in our society, we are being called upon to bear witness to the Lordship of Christ, especially over human sexuality, in a culture that is running headlong in the opposite direction, a culture that is saying that human sexuality is something that we can control, something that we can define for ourselves, something that we can reconfigure and arrange in whatever way we want. And for someone to, to say that we can't is hateful and is bigoted and is worthy of censure and marginalization in our society. And as we bear witness more and more to the Lordship of Christ in this culture, prepare yourself to be marginalized more and more from the mainstream of society. We now live in a society where a professional athlete who openly proclaims that he is a homosexual, is praised, lauded, and admired for his courage. Whereas a professional athlete who openly proclaims that Christ is Lord over him is routinely ridiculed in the media. I say this not to whine about it. I say it because it is reality. And it is reality we must be prepared for. We must not be surprised that such is the case. The seed of the serpent will not warm to those who declare that Christ is Lord. Be prepared for this enemy. He is coming against us. And let us pray then that the final judgment of God will come against him. So that one day he will have no more power over this world. So we should desire and pray for the final judgment because of our formidable enemy first. But second, we should desire and pray for the final judgment because it will be our final salvation in verses 9 to 15. In Romans 8.24, Paul says, In this hope we were saved. And so he mentions being saved as a past reality. We were saved at the time we came to faith in Christ. But in the same book, Romans 5, 9, he says, Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. And so there, salvation is a future reality. We will be saved on a future day. There, there's a multiple dimensions uh, of salvation 
in, in the New Testament. We were saved, but we will also be saved from the wrath of God when it comes upon this world. But did you know the Bible teaches not only will we be saved from the wrath of God, we will be saved by the wrath of God. We will be saved from our enemies by God's wrath that comes against them. Judgment and salvation always go together in Scripture. When God poured out judgment on the Egyptians by closing the Red Sea over the army, pursuing the Israelites, that very act of judgment was at the same time an act of deliverance for God's covenant people. And so Asaph prays to God. He calls out to Him as he turns to petition in verse 9. He calls out to God to destroy, to utterly destroy these powers that have arisen against Israel. And in calling upon God to destroy them, he mentions, first of all, past deliverances in verses 9 to 12. And then he uses several analogies for their destruction in verses 13 to 15. So in the section on past deliverances, notice in verse 9, he says, do to them as you did to Midian. This would be a reference to Judges 7 and 8 and the story of Gideon. When Gideon's forces destroyed a Midianite army that was threatening Israel and oppressing them. Uh, he leaves off that story for a, a couple of lines, then he comes back to it in verse 11 and 12 when he says, Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb. Oreb and Zeb were princes of the people of Midian, uh, whom Gideon's forces killed and then decapitated. And then the, the second line of verse 11, all their princes like Zeba and Zalmunna, these were kings of Midian, whom Gideon himself killed with the sword. But another story that he refers to is uh, in verse 9b. Look at uh, the second part of verse 9. He says, as to Sisera and Jabin at the river Kishon. He goes on to describe that in verse 10. Uh, Jabin and Sisera were the, the leaders. Jabin, the king of Canaan, Sisera, his commander, who came against the Israelites in Judges 4 in the story of Barak, the judge, uh, inspired to lead by pro the prophetess Deborah, and how Barak led his forces in triumph over Jabin, over Sisera. And in the battle, Sisera escaped. And he ran, as his forces were routed, he ran to the tent of Haber the Kenite, whom he thought was an ally. And Haber's wife, Jael, was there. And he asked her for some water, but she gave him a skin of milk, and he drank, and, and he lay down, and she covered him over with a rug. And while he slept, Jael took a tent peg and drove it through his temple in an image reminiscent of Genesis 3.15, where the promise of the seed of the woman will one day come to crush the head of the serpent. Now in both stories of, of the deliverance of the Midianites, uh, from the Midianites and the deliverance from Jabin and Sisera, both stories emphasize in the book of Judges that God has delivered Israel against overwhelming odds. In the case of the Midianites, there were over, well over 100,000 of them. And God commanded Gideon to whittle his forces down to 300 men. And God miraculously delivers the Israelites from the Midianites on that occasion. In the case of Jabin and Sisera, Sisera commands an army that has 900 chariots. Now, if you are a non-chariot people, chariots are next to impossible to defeat in battle. As Israel, being a non-chariot people, would have had great fear of 900 chariots. And yet, these chariots, according to the Song of Deborah in Judges 5, became mired in the river Kishon so that they became useless to the forces of Sisera, just like the chariots of the Egyptians had become useless in the Red Sea as they pursued the Israelites. God delivers in miraculous ways against all odds, and Asaph prays, that He would do it again. And that it would be unmistakable that God is the one who has delivered His people. 
And so he prays for God to destroy the enemy the way that he did in those days. And he says so in verse 13, using several analogies in these verses. He says, Oh God, make them like whirling dust. You notice a footnote on there. Uh, it says it could mean like a tumbleweed, and that perhaps is a better translation. This would have been a, a certain kind of plant that, that uh, broke off of its roots easily and, and blew around as a Middle Eastern tumbleweed. Or in uh, the next verse, the, the next line of the verse, like chaff before the wind, the, the empty husks of grain, the, the light, meaningless, worthless part of the grain that is separated out and typically gathered up to be burned. In other words, he's praying, make this formidable foe nothing. Make them into nothing before us. Uh, he mentions in verses 14, fire consuming the forest. You can see that in your eyes, in your mind's eye, that <coughs> the, the utter destruction that flames wreak upon a forest in verse 15, he speaks of God pursuing them with His tempest, terrifying them with His hurricane. There were many nations in that day who worshipped Baal and who believed that this God was God of the storm, that He had power over the rain and the thunder and the lightning. But the Bible makes it abundantly clear. God, the God of Israel, the Creator of all that exists, He has power over the storm. And the storm as an indication of his power is also an indication of his ability to destroy his enemies. So what then is the final destiny of the powers of this age? Well, according to 2 Thessalonians verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 9, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. All of their designs, all of their power will come to nothing. And they themselves will answer to God for their sins. And if we are a people who pray, your kingdom come, we are a people who are praying that that judgment would indeed come to pass. Now perhaps one might be inclined to accuse me of being bloodthirsty and vindictive in proclaiming such a message. I think it's exactly the opposite. I think the only thing that keeps us from being bloodthirsty and vindictive is knowing that judgment belongs to the Lord, not to us. You see, the point is not that judgment in and of itself is bad, and that's why we shouldn't exercise it ourselves. The point is that it is something that only God can do. And that's why I don't seek retaliation against my enemies. That's why I don't seek personal vengeance. I entrust it to the Lord who will, in His time, deal with everything. Romans 12, 19 makes this exact point. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Why? Because vengeance is inherently wrong? No. He says, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And when His vengeance comes, we will know the salvation of the Lord. So let us pray for that day to come. Let us desire that day to come as the fullness of our salvation. And then a third reason we should desire and pray for final judgment is because it will vindicate God's name. We should desire and pray for the final judgment because it will vindicate God's name in verses 16 to 18. It's important that we keep in mind what the real battle is here. The real battle of Psalm 83 is not Israel versus the nations. The real battle is God versus His enemies. And the same is true for us. We have enemies. And those enemies oppose us, not so much because they oppose us, but because they oppose God. So Asaph cries out here, not only that his enemies may be thwarted, not only that they may be destroyed, 
but that they may be shamed. That in the judgment that is coming upon them, it might be fully revealed to the world that their acts are sinful, that what they have done is wrong, and that God is in the right. Look at verse uh, 16, the first line. Fill their faces with shame. Look at verse 17. Let them be put to shame and dismayed forever. Let them perish in disgrace. Now the outcome of this shaming is in the, the second line of verse 16. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name, O Lord. Look also at verse 18. That they may know that you alone whose name is the Lord, are the Most High over all the earth. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I wrestled with these verses this week. Most commentators, especially verse 16, understand it to teach the hope of the redemption of God's enemies. That in the suffering of this punishment from the Lord, they will turn and be redeemed. They will seek the Lord. That's entirely possible that that's what Asaph means. And it would certainly fit with what the rest of the Bible teaches about God. But I wrestled. I want to believe that that's there. But I wrestled and wrestled and I could not come to, to a personal affirmation that that is exactly what Asaph means. Because of the description of the judgment throughout the rest of the psalm, Asaph is calling for total destruction. He's calling for them to perish in disgrace, to be, to be put to shame and dismayed forever. If anything, the emphasis falls not upon the redemption of God's enemies, but on the vindication of God's name. And the desire that the enemies of God might seek the Lord, that they might know that He is the Most High, this could be simply a way of Asaph harking back to a, an event similar to this in Israel's history when Egypt was oppressing Israel and Pharaoh was hardened against God and, and God kept bringing plague after plague after plague and finally uh, with the plague of locusts, uh, not locusts, of hail upon the, the land destroying their crops and in Exodus chapter 9 verse 27, Pharaoh finally says, this time I have sinned. The Lord is in the right and I and my people are in the wrong. Now this is not an indication that Pharaoh has repented and is redeemed. We see that through the rest of the story. But it is an indication that Pharaoh recognizes that he has lost. And he is now put to shame for his arrogant defiance of the Lord. I see what Asaph is praying for here as he is praying for the fulfillment of Philippians 2, 10, and 11 in New Testament terms, where Paul writes that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Not a promise of universal redemption, but yes, a promise of universal recognition of who the Lord truly is. So when Christ comes, He will come to be vindicated over His enemies. And if we love God, we are commanded above all things to love God. Love Him with all of our heart with all of our soul, with all of our strength, if we truly love God, then our greatest desire should be for the vindication of His name. Of all the promises that the final judgment holds out for us, the vindication of the name of our God against His enemies ought to stand at the top. You see, every sin tells a lie about God. Every sin that has been committed from the beginning of human history, all the, the trillions upon trillions upon trillions of sins are telling a lie about God. They are saying, God is not Lord. I am. Every time sin is committed, 
that lie is put out there. Now I want you to imagine what would happen if God allowed those lies to go on and to go on and to go on and to go on. And those lies were never answered. Those lies were allowed to echo out into all eternity without a word of response from the sovereign creator of the universe. What would we conclude? We would conclude He really isn't the Lord. He really isn't who He says He is. He is not the sovereign creator and ruler of this world. He can't even overcome the defiance of His creatures. So make no mistake about it, an answer will come. This is why the Bible teaches that retribution is absolutely essential to God's holiness. He will answer with the final judgment every single sin that has ever been committed. And when He does, not only will He be vindicated over His enemies, He will reveal His glory to us. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 10 speaks of Christ saying that He will come Listen to why He will come. This, this is amazing. He will come to be glorified in His saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed. He comes for that very purpose, that we might marvel at Him when His glory is revealed and His name vindicated. And on that day, we will join with the redeemed of every nation and we will sing with greater joy than we have ever known. Who is this who comes in glory with the trump of jubilee? Lord of battles, God of armies. He has gained the victory. He who on the cross did suffer. He who from the grave arose. He has vanquished sin and Satan. He by death has spoiled his foes. More than any other reason, let us desire, let us pray for the final judgment to come because of our zeal for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in this world. If you are not a believer in Christ, you have never called upon Him to deliver you from the consequences of your sins, I want you to know something this morning. I do not desire this judgment to fall upon you. And we as a church do not desire this judgment to fall upon you. Now, I've just finished a sermon in which I said we should pray for the final judgment to come. How does this cohere? I see it this way. We want the final judgment to come. Yes. We desire God to triumph over His enemies. Yes. We do not want you to belong to that group when it comes. That is the difference. We don't want anyone in this room to fall under the judgment that certainly will come. Our call is to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captor. So if you're not a believer, I want you to know that every minute of every day that you do not bend the knee to Christ is another minute that you stand in defiance of Him. And your time to defy Him is limited. I don't know how long it will be, but that is not something you can do forever. You must turn from your sins and embrace the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. Believe that He is the God-man who was sent to this world by the love of the Father. That He lived a perfect life in fulfillment of the law and that He went to the cross willingly, not for anything that He had done, but He went there, and I'm calling upon you to believe this this morning, He went there for you. He went there to die, to take the wrath of God, to take the final judgment of God in your place, and that God raised Him from the dead on the third day, that He exalted Him to His right hand, and now He rules over all things and will come one day, to judge the living and the dead. If you will turn from sin and call upon Him, it doesn't matter how long you've defied Him. It doesn't matter to what degree you have defied Him. Call upon Him 
and His promise is He will receive you. That is how good and gracious He is. And I call upon you in fulfillment of His command and obedience to what He commanded to show the world that you are now His. That you are not Lord of yourself, but He is Lord of you by submitting yourself to baptism. Come and talk to us today about baptizing you. And uh, we would be delighted to do so. If you are a believer this morning, and uh, you have professed your faith publicly and are now a member in good standing with an evangelical church, we want to invite you. If that's not true of you, we just ask you to let the, the elements go by when they're passed. But if that is you, we invite you to eat and drink with us at the Lord's table this morning. Eat and drink rejoicing that the body and the blood that we memorialize belongs to the Christ who was broken, but who is now raised and who will come again to judge the living and the dead. You know, one of my favorite books is uh, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. I love the book, love the movie with Gregory Peck as the hero Atticus Finch. It's a story about Depression-era Georgia where Atticus is a, an attorney who's been assigned a case to defend a black man, Tom Robinson, in a case where he's been accused of raping a white woman. And in the course of the trial, it becomes clear, it becomes clear beyond doubt that Tom Robinson is innocent. The evidence could not be mistaken. But the question remains as to whether an all-white jury in Depression-era Georgia can evaluate the evidence fairly and come to the right conclusion in the case of a black man accused of raping a white woman. So in his closing arguments, Atticus Finch begins to speak to the jury about the notion of justice and equality before the law. And this is what he says. Our courts have their faults, as does any human institution. But in this country, our courts are the great levelers. And in our courts, all men are created equal. I'm no idealist to believe firmly in the integrity of our courts and in the jury system. That is no ideal to me. It is a living, working reality. The Lordship of Jesus Christ over this creation is not an ideal. It's not a pious dream that inspires us but otherwise doesn't touch reality. It is a living, working reality. One that we will see with our eyes on the day He is revealed to us. So until that day comes, let us be content to see with the eyes of faith. Eyes that are nourished once again by the tangible symbols of the bread and the cup. So as we eat and drink together, let us pray once more. Your kingdom come. Let's take a moment of silence. Would you bow your heads, please, and meditate on the truths of God's Word as we prepare to distribute the bread and the cup.